Hey everybody, it is 12 o'clock on Friday, June 5th, if you're keeping track, and uh, we are excited to welcome you to this week's novel coronavirus update for clinicians. I am Dr. Michelle Fiskus. I'm the medical director of the Tennessee Vaccine Preventable Diseases and Immunization Program, and uh, to my right, about six feet away, is Dr. Kimberly Lamar, who's the Assistant Commissioner of the Office of Minority Health and Disparities Elimination here at TDH, and she's going to be talking a little bit later um, this afternoon about what we're doing around uh, testing and caring for some of our vulnerable populations in Tennessee. So we're excited to have you with us today, Dr. Lamar. Thank you for the invitation to join you today. Great to have you. Um, Dr. Lamar and I worked together for, oh gosh, a couple of, at least a couple of years now. Yeah, so uh, so we've gotten to uh, be friends and then and then have a, have an opportunity to work more closely together during um, during this pandemic. Um, as you saw on the first slide, we we are going back to some Menti questions uh, this time. Menti was really misbehaving for a little while. And uh, it wasn't actually showing you the data, although I could see the data. So um, we're trying it again. So if you will take out your device and go to www.menti.com, and you can do that on your computer or you can do it on your phone, uh, doesn't matter. And then it will ask you for a code and you enter 893348 and then you will see our, um, our questions. So there's about five questions through the presentation. The first one is to tell us who you are. Um, we like to know who's attending these webinars um, so that we know how to cater, um, cater the content to you and, and make sure that it's appropriate for you uh, and that we're covering the topics that you need. So um, the numbers are slowly coming up now. We've got about a hundred people or so on the webinar, so um, <laughs> we'll give you a few more minutes to kind of log these in. But you can move through these questions um, as you want to. You don't have to wait for me to um, advance them to put in your answers. So even if I've moved on past, you can still log on to menti.com and put in your information. So uh, the second thing we want to know is have you attended these Friday updates before today? So we know we have uh, a lot of folks that tune into these that um, have been on before, and we're really glad that uh, to see those folks that uh, are coming on for the first time because it means that the content we have is, is something that's worth an hour of your time. So uh, we're grateful for that, and uh, there's at least one person who's never been here before, so we welcome you as well. And then uh, the next question is, how is your stress level? And uh, this will actually show up broken out by how you identified yourself in the first slide. So um, the colors are, um, it should be broken out by the type of um, provider that you are. I may have messed that up on this slide this time. <laughs> but. Um, that's really interesting. So we have asked this question almost every week since we've been doing these webinars. And we started out uh, early on with the majority of folks being I'm good or I'm a little bit stressed and no one in the I'm really stressed category. And we have seen this consistent slide to the right of these responses from uh, you know having fewer and fewer folks that are in that I'm good category and more folks uh, reporting that they've got, they're, they're stressed because of this and, and some that are really, um, really having some difficulties. So um, we just want you to know that, that you do have a, a community here who is, uh, is supportive and I think sometimes getting on webinars like this even can assist with um, helping to alleviate some of that stress. Um, I want to remind you, oh no, it's gone. Oh, maybe it comes after this. Um, I did have a slide, it might have disappeared, that there is a uh, physician call line that operates um, most, almost 24 hours a day that is staffed by psychiatrists um, across the country who are there uh, at the other end of the phone to talk to people who um, might be experiencing stress to the point where it might be helpful to talk to a mental health professional. Um, I'll make sure that you've, you've got that information if I didn't just get my slides out of order here um, so that you can uh, use that resource if you need to. Um, so 
we stood up our incident command system here at Tennessee Department of Health on January 15 when we began to hear of cases that had entered the United States. So that was 142 very long days ago that uh, Department of Health has been working on this pandemic. It's been 92 days since our first case. Um, and uh, we continue to have a call, a call line for clinicians that you can call into for assistance. If you have questions about COVID-19 uh, around testing patients or um, infection prevention issues, you can call us at 615-741-7247 from 8 to 4.30 Monday through Friday. And then overnight, there's always one of the uh, physicians that um, works in this division of the Department of Health that's on call for any kind of public health emergencies that might come up that can't wait till the next day. From a global perspective, uh, this is what we're looking at now. So I put up last week's numbers just so that you could get some idea of the jump that we see in a seven-day period in the world. So um, almost a, a million more confirmed cases in the last seven days, uh, somewhere close to 30,000 deaths uh, that have been reported. And, uh, and then there's the United States um, test result number. And then the bottom is the world epi curve. So um, you can see that we had sort of this plateau over the course of late April to May, uh, and then really started to kind of tick up. And so notice too that the scale of these two graphs on the bottom has changed from a max of 120,000 last week to a max of 150,000 this week. So while the, while the graph appears to have shrunk, um, the scale is different, and you see this really uh, pretty marked uptick in the number of global cases being reported. Um, the United States certainly has the largest number of cases in the world, and so this may reflect some of that reopening that's happening. There's also been a, a tremendous outbreak of COVID-19 in Brazil, uh, and so those numbers may be contributing uh, to this as well. Um, this is what those epi curves look like. So uh, the top 10 countries and their COVID uh, epi curves, this is the five-day moving average of new cases. And so the United States is that top uh, squiggly greenish kind of colored line. And uh, you, this kind of reflects the same thing. We saw this decrease in the number of cases that was pretty consistent through April. And then really in May, we've seen this plateau of, of that decline, which is concerning. Um, and then on the left side here, the number of United States cases that's gone up by uh, 150,000 or so in the course of the week. Um, deaths as reported by uh, these numbers, which are um, uh, the Data US, USA site, um, up by about 6,000 or so over the course of the week. This is my new favorite graphic that uh, Johns Hopkins is putting out. So these are all the states in the United States with their epi curves, and then a legend where uh, the darker shade of green you are, the more you are into getting past this, and the darker shade of red you are, uh, the more trouble you're in. And so Tennessee is a shade of pink um, because we've not really been moving in a great direction right now um, compared to some of our surrounding states in the south. Um, we're still struggling with the, the pandemic and our numbers of cases here. So this is the last uh, or the most recent um, epi curve. So that squiggly line that's drawn is the seven-day average of positive tests. And uh, I marked here where the stay-at-home order expired at the end of April. And then we had this low shortly after of 3.6% of the tests that were done in Tennessee that were positive. And then um, since about 14 days after that stay-at-home order expired, we've seen this steady increase in the, num the percent positive of our tests now up to 5.7% as of this morning uh, or light, late last night um, over the course of the, the past month since that uh, reopening occurred. So um, we, we saw early indications of this that we talked about in last week's webinar. Um, that number has continued to increase since last Friday, and we'll continue to, to keep a, a look at that. So as you're looking at this, the, the tall orange bars are the number of tests. The darker orange bars at the bottom are the um, positive daily tests. And World Health Organization really wants countries to be under 5% positivity rate. So two things could be happening here. One could be that we're not testing as many people um, in the state, but we 
We know that our testing capability has expanded to an extent. Um, the other is that we're seeing more local transmission, which um, since our testing rates remain good, it looks like this may be more um, community transmission than it, than it is uh, that we're not testing enough folks. For um, by population, we rank 13th in the United States for the number of tests that are done per 100,000 residents of our state. Um, that's 7,000 tests per 100,000 people who live in, in the uh, state of Tennessee and a rate of 372 cases per 100,000 residents, 5.9 deaths per 100,000 residents. And we're um, coming up to close to a half a million um, tests that have been performed in the state of Tennessee um, since the beginning of this response. Comparing last week's numbers to this week's numbers, uh, we're, we've crossed 25,000 cases. That's, that's up uh, about 3,500 3, since last week. Um, the deaths are up by 45 or so, and um, hospitalization numbers you know, continue to climb a little bit. And so the, the hot spots remain in the larger metro areas, which makes sense just because of, of population, but also because there are higher minority um, communities in, in those areas that may not have um, access to care, may be living with uh, chronic conditions that uh, put them at higher risk for disease, um, and there's uh, crowding of housing or sometimes, you know, just inability or unavailability of housing in those areas. Um, then the, the surrounding metro area continues to have a, a high number of cases, and then down there uh, in the southeast, you see Chattanooga at 964. Um, and uh, those are really where the, most of the hot spots are in the state right now. And this is our epi curve for the state, the daily case count numbers that uh, kind of ebb and flow through the course of the week. So those really low bars that are up there reflect the weekends when uh, we don't do as much testing. Uh, um, and then the, the higher bars are the, the weekdays generally, but overall this is a curve that continues to um, move northward. Down below that you also see that there's been an uptick in inpatient admissions um, also over the last week or two um, compared to earlier in May. We've seen a rise in those numbers. ICU numbers have ticked up a little bit but look to have plateaued and then the, the ventilated numbers have remained pretty consistent in the 60s. So, so far we've had about 7% of the population of Tennessee that has been tested. I say about because um, some of those tests are, um, can be uh, repeat tests in individuals. Um, our overall death rate is 1.6% of cases, but if you're over the age of 61, it's 9.1%. So almost one in 10 who are over the age of 61 who contract COVID-19, are dying from COVID-19. If they're housed in a long-term care facility, that's almost 12% of, uh, of those who've been infected in long-term care facilities that have died from COVID-19. So again, um, making sure that we're doing everything that we can to protect this population of, um, of older individuals in the state is critically important. 84% of the deaths in the state are, are in those who are 61 years of age and older. And I also want to draw your attention to the case counts in children. So the zero to 10 year olds have increased um, by several hundred since last week. So they've gone from one to two to three to four percent of the positive cases in the state. Um, the 11 to 20 year olds uh, have likewise continued to see an uptick in those number of cases and have increased uh, over the last couple of weeks from seven to eight percent. So um, there, there really isn't a population here that's being spared by uh, this infection. We talked in depth a couple of weeks ago about this emerging Peds multisystem inflammatory syndrome that looks like a Kawasaki's type syndrome where it's a uh, severe inflammatory response in children that appears to be happening four to six weeks after their acute infection and um, has, has really been um, uh, really impacting uh, children. These, these children often end up in intensive care units. They uh, often end up intubated. They can have cardiac dysfunction. They, uh, a large uh, percentage of them have acute renal injuries. Some have had to go on dialysis. 
Um, it doesn't tend to, uh, to be fatal in this phase, but it certainly um, impacts them significantly and, and it remains to be seen if we're going to see a shortening of lifespan in this population of children who are being impacted by um, Peds inflammatory multisystem uh, syndrome. Um, we have identified our first case in the state and that's in the western part of the state and we have several others who are under investigation right now that uh, we're, we're still digging into to confirm. So uh, I want to remind you of the CDC advisory and our call for cases that if you uh, see someone under the age of 21 who presents with fever uh, for more than 24 hours, has elevated inflammatory markers, and there's a, a long list there, and has multi-system organ involvement um, and severe illness that requires hospitalization, and they have no alternative diagnosis, then, uh, then please notify your local Department of Health um, or you can notify us here at the state of that patient so that we can investigate and, and determine if this might be secondary to COVID-19. Not all of these children um, have positive PCR tests for COVID-19 because the thought is that this occurs four to six weeks after their initial infection, so they no longer have the virus that's detectable. But um, there's, in some of the international studies, there's been about 75% of those children who have had antibody detected to COVID-19. So we know there's at least a strong correlation between COVID-19 infection uh, and a, a subsequent um, result of this widespread inflammatory um, problem that, that is impacting multi-organ uh, systems. So again, our definition, uh, which is a little bit different than the CDC definition, we do not require a positive test for COVID-19 but a patient less than 21 years of age with sustained fever, elevated inflammatory markers and multi-system organ involvement with no other plausible diagnosis needs to be reported either to your local um, health department or you can email amanda.hartley at tn.gov who's the um, nurse consultant here in, in our program at the State Department of Health who is uh, helping us with the investigation of those cases. Uh, there are a few headlines that came up over the course of the last week. You may have seen this randomized trial of hydroxychloroquine as uh, post-exposure prophylaxis for COVID-19 that came out of the University of Minnesota and was published in the New England Journal earlier this week that showed that there was no benefit to giving hydroxychloroquine to people who had known exposure to COVID-19 as a post-exposure prophylaxis. So this further adds to the evidence out there that um, hydroxychloroquine has, has not had evidence to support use for treatment, post-exposure prophylaxis, or prevention of, um, of COVID-19 infections, and outside of clinical trials should not be prescribed to people who um, may be at risk or who uh, have been impacted by COVID-19. There was a, an MMWR that was published this week that looked at emergency department visits over the course of this pandemic and they saw a decrease in 42% across all visits in emergency departments. So it's not that people uh, suddenly aren't ill or breaking bones or um, having neurologic symptoms or chest pain, it's that they're not coming to the emergency room. And so the result of this is going to be that um, people are delaying care and, and therefore going to have some impact to um, their positive outcome um, opportunities because they're not coming in to, um, to be evaluated as they would have. There was also um, a manuscript that was accepted for publication in clinical infectious diseases, so there was some speculation that, you know, will we see a decline in COVID um, as we move into the summer months, and, and many suspected that we would not because of the numbers that have been seen in Australia um, during the winter time here, that was summer there. Um, and in some of the South American countries. So this showed that there might be some minimal but detectable decrease in um, SARS-CoV-2 virus um, presence up to about 57 degrees Fahrenheit, but temperatures above that really didn't seem to make any difference in that. So there's, there's not uh, much indication, at least from this particular study, that we should expect any significant decline in um, SARS-CoV-2 infections over the course of the summer. And then 
just yesterday it was announced that the uh, Trump administration had selected five coronavirus vaccine candidates as finalists for what they call warp speed development of coronavirus vaccine. Uh, we've talked about several of these uh, over our past webinars, but I wanted to give you an update. So just um, for reminder of the phases of clinical trials, phase one is very low numbers of participants and looking at safety. Um, and those are the first human studies. And then phase two is for safety and dosing where they uh, still have a, a, quite a limited number of participants. Um, and it's phase three where we really start to get into thousands of numbers um, and then headed to FDA uh, um, review and approval. So none of the vaccines that have been chosen by the administration are beyond phase two. Um, and those that are in phase two are very early in phase two. So we're, we're still very, very early in this process of vaccine development. The first um, couple are actually still preclinical, so they haven't even begun the, even the first human trials yet. One is a vaccine from Johnson & Johnson. Uh, Johnson & Johnson had a successful Ebola virus vaccine that they developed on a modified viral vector. Um, they expect to start some phase one human trials later in the summer. First they had said September, but it looks like they're trying to speed that up. Um, as, as much as I tried to dig on this, I could not find a lot of information about the J&J &J vaccine. Um, the second is, uh, are, are two vaccines, two uh, variations of vaccines coming out from Merck, one in combination with um, an entity called AIVI, and the second one is, is in cooperation with a company called Themis. Um, the first is a recombinant vesicular stomatitis virus, or RVSV vaccine, um, that was manufactured similar to Merck's Ebola virus vaccine. And then the second one is a recombinant vaccine with live attenuated measles virus. So um, that's an interesting um, movement on that. Both of these uh, are aiming for a single dose vaccine, and that seems to be Merck's um, little stake in this is, is that they're the ones that are really concentrating on trying to get a single dose vaccine, understanding that the other vaccines that um, have been in production have all looked to being two dose vaccines. Um, and there are you know, obviously challenges with getting people fully vaccinated and protected with a two dose series. Uh, they also have not yet begun uh, human trials and they should be um, stepping into those a little bit later this summer. And then there is one vaccine of these five that's in phase one clinical trials. That's the Pfizer and BioNTech vaccine. This is an mRNA vaccine. And uh, they have four different versions of this that, are, um, that just moved into um, human clinical trials for phase one, the beginning of May. Um, the messenger RNA vaccines have not been used in humans before. So this is an, uh, a vaccine that is injected with messenger RNA that, um, that tells the body to code for one of the proteins, uh, usually the spike protein that is on the, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus, and um, produce that protein, which is then seen as foreign and, and produces the antibody response. So unlike other vaccines we've had in the past where it's um, live attenuated or live or um, killed um, vaccine or a um, a protein that is injected, this is one where the, the body of the um, host actually produces the protein itself and then produces the antibody. Um, the other um, phase two vaccine is by Moderna, which uh, has had a lot of press, not necessarily because it's better, but just because they have a lot of press. Um, this is also an mRNA company or mRNA vaccine that's um, in development. It's a little further along in the process. They've had some early two, uh, early phase two studies that have come out, and they're finalizing their protocol for phase three, which they expect to start um, sometime in the next couple of months. And then. Uh, one other phase two drug that's done uh, through collaboration from the University of Oxford in England and AstraZeneca, and this is a chimpanzee adenovirus vector virus. Um, this is from a team that had previously developed a vaccine for MERS, and uh, they've had some early um, positive results that where they were able to induce um, antibody and also protect re-exposed monkeys. Um, that have been looked at. They moved into their phase two testing 
uh, at the end of April. And then um, just an update on point of care testing progress, which isn't really an update because nothing's changed in the last few weeks that we've talked about this. So there are still four CLIA waves molecular test platforms with the FDA emergency use authorization. Uh, and you can find that list and, and keep track of it if you'd like on the FDA um, website. Just look for emergency use authorization for um, testing. Uh, the first is the Abbott ID Now machine, which uh, was probably the first one to market. Um, moderately expensive, but quick, um, but it's recently had some sensitivity issues that they're working through. The second is the Cephi Gym, uh, Gen Expert Express, which has a Clio Wave platform. It's quite expensive, $16,000 for their um, base unit, which runs two tests at a time. It takes about an hour to run those tests, but it has um, really good sensitivity. Uh, problem there is that the cartridges have not been readily available because this seems to be the, the preferred um, platform for a lot of the larger labs that are out there, and so everyone's competing for the same um, cartridges to be able to run these tests. Um, the third is Mesa Biotech Acular's platform, which is inexpensive. It's about $900. Um, it's quick, I think uh, 15 to 20 minutes to run the test, but we have reached out to this company multiple times and are being sent to a, a third party and getting a generic email response. So um, we're not too um, optimistic about the availability of the MESA machine. And then the fourth one is the Quidel Sophia 2. Um, this is a, a test that's very similar to some of the uh, countertop flu or pregnancy or RSV tests that you're used to running um, that uh, can be done really quickly. Um, the SOFIA 2 requires a reader, and uh, so you can't interpret them with the, with the naked eye. You have to put them into a reader. Um, these tests are uh, not too expensive, but the negatives are supposed to be confirmed by one of the other PCR assays. So a positive is helpful, um, a negative uh, really should be confirmed by, uh, by a PCR molecular test. And then there are several home test collections that are on the market. Um, the big barrier to these is most of them require the patient to go on and report symptoms or a known exposure uh, so that there is approval by the company before they'll send them the test kit to collect the specimen themselves. Um, so that's a barrier for uh, anyone who's trying to do surveillance testing or um, look at, at uh, using something like this to bring employees back to work, perhaps, is that uh, these tests generally won't be run on people who don't have symptoms or uh, known exposure. And then a reminder that while there are a plethora of serology tests that are out there, there are none that are CLIA waived that have FDA EUA. And um, there is a wide range of sensitivity and specificity, even in the ones that do have uh, the FDA EUA. There's um, really detailed information on those platforms at the FDA website. So if you're ordering uh, serology for some reason, um, you'll want to go on the FDA website and have a good understanding for the limitations of the test that you might be ordering based on that individual platform. It's still recommended at this point that uh, serology testing not be used to make any kind of individual level decisions about uh, whether someone may or may not be immune to the virus. Um, the, the testing just uh, isn't necessarily all that uh, specific yet, and uh, we just really don't know how to interpret those results. So um, it, the recommendation still from CDC and others is to, uh, to not do individual level serology tests. So um, we've talked on and off through these webinars about availability of PPE um, for you in, if you're in practice. So if you are in practice seeing patients, um, I'd like to know if you have tried to order PPE through the Survey123 link that we've provided previously. This is a link um, to Tima to uh, ask for PPE. And hopefully, if you're still having supply chain issues and you're unable to get PPE on your own for your practices, um, you would be able to come on to Survey123 and enter a request for that and have that request fulfilled um, through TEMA. So this option is still available to you, and I'll give you the link for that in a second. Um, but I'd like to get this kind of feedback so that I can give it to TEMA and let them know 
um, what it's looking like as far as the, um, the availability or the ability for providers to request PPE through TEMA and have that su successfully delivered to them. So for those of you who have ordered PPE through the survey, um, have, have you gotten it? And if so, how long did it take for you to get it? Um, generally, we were seeing a turnaround of somewhere between five and seven days for um, folks to get their PPE orders delivered to them, and they're um, generally delivered uh, to your door, either if you're local here in Nashville, sometimes that's a truck that comes up and drops it off, um, or sometimes if you're um, out of the greater Nashville area, that might be um, coming to you by FedEx, but you should be able to enter requests for N95 masks, surgical masks, gloves, gowns, foot coverings, face shields, um, all of those supplies you should be able to order through TEMA if you have not been able to acquire those on your own. So really good to see that um, for those of you have, who have ordered, you've generally been getting that, um, those supplies within about 10 days. And so um, for those of you who might not have been aware of this uh, or haven't tried to do this, if you need PPE and you haven't been able to get it, you can go to this link, https colon slash slash arcg, A-R-C-G dot I-S slash one, capital L, little I, capital C, capital C, capital P, because they can't make this just a request PPE dot com kind of website, but there it is on the screen. Um, you do need to enter the passcode 8362 in order to put in your complete uh, request there. And um, you can order up to a two-week supply of PPE. If you're a practice, uh, I'm not sure that they yet have practice as an, as an option for an organization type, so you're welcome to just click other and put in um, what kind of entity you are. And then that PPE should be sh directly shipped to the address that you provide in that link. So um, please try that if you're having trouble with PPE. They are um, trying to um, build up the supply that's, that's over at TEMA, um, and they're hearing that the supply chains are opening, but we know that for those of you who, who might only need to place small orders, that a lot of times those small orders aren't prioritized by the distributors, so this may be a good way to, um, to get what you need in the interim. So now uh, I want to pass things over to Dr. Kimberly Lamar, and we're going to have a, a little discussion about what's been going on uh, across the state with um, specifically looking at vulnerable populations in Tennessee. So uh, I know that, that you and I have worked together a lot over the month of May to, yes. to try to expand access and education to um, some of our populations. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what's been going on there? Well, similarly to um, what we've been saying across, yeah, similarly to what we've been saying across the country, um, a lot of our urban areas um, across the state of Tennessee, um, two primarily being Nashville and Memphis, are seeing a large proportion of those cases and deaths um, um, ha existing amongst uh, communities of color, um, individuals of color, um, highest amongst our African American communities um, in some of those cities at rates of um, as high as 70 um, percent. Um, and so our challenge right now is to work with communities, um, both communities of color, but also focusing on all disparate, disadvantaged um, uh, marginalized communities, which will also include our disabled communities, um, um, our communities um, of various faiths and cultures, and making sure that, for one, we have an avenue to understand and hear, um, listening to the challenges and the barriers that are existing in the communities, but also being able to respond collectively, um, those with existing resources, and then, too, from our perspective, being able to provide those resources to communities to ensure that we are effectively and efficiently addressing COVID. One of the strategies that we've been able to implement has been to establish a, um, a task force, our Health Disparities um, Task Force. Our task force is represented by um, community nonprofits, the faith community, 
our local and state government officials, as well as our academic partners. Um, we are uh, building upon established relationships that we already had in place with, with many of those organizations and stakeholders, but also establishing new partners, working more at the grassroots levels, with, particularly in our, um, in, in our immigrant, Hispanic, Latino communities where that level of engagement is so important um, to the efforts that we, we are undertaking. Um, our task force is a regular meeting. We meet right now weekly um, in terms of a one-hour um, um, call, similar to um, the webinar that we're on today. Um, we have um, a couple hundred of um, uh, partners that um, share with us each week and share their resources, um, offer ideas and recommendations as to how we could um, engage better. And again, we are very responsive to that. Um, the task force is also, again, our, our, our means of hearing from the community. We don't do a lot of talking from our perspective. Our goal is to, to hear, to understand, um, to know the best approaches, best strategies we need to implement to engage the community and ensure that testing is available, resources are accessed um, um, in the appropriate channels. The second um, uh, um, approach um, as a result that has occurred through um, uh, what we've learned um, from engaging with our communities across the, the state, um, we've been able to generate um, through the Office of Minority Health several um, um, PSA announcements, um, commercials that are um, being um, aired uh, across the state, um, particularly our metro areas, um, in multiple markets, um, local media markets, um, those targeting specific um, demographics. And so we've done a lot of work um, in creating those messages. The important thing about those messages is that we were we we understand how important representation from the different in different communities are um, in making sure that our images um, are reflective of the diversity um, of the state of Tennessee. And so we have generated PSAs that reflect images of African American men and women and children and um, all faiths and 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 different cultures and and in languages that are in, um, that are endemic to our state as well. And so we do have our PSAs available in English and Spanish, and we're working right now to do a lot of our um, uh, other marketing materials and messaging um, in a variety of additional languages and additional indigenous uh, dialects as well. Um, our PSAs has been focused on one, um, focusing on, a of course, the importance of physical distancing, not social distancing, but physical separation um, as much um, as that is um, possible within families. Um, we've focused on masking and the importance of wearing masks um, both in, um, in, in, in indoors um, when they're in um, crowds, but also in public, in restaurants, and in, in stores, and making sure masking is, um, is, is, is available as well, and so connecting um, our, our residents with resources to obtain those resources. We've also focused on um, making sure that we have a platform to share our resources. And so on our state page um, for our Office of Minority Health, um, we do have a resource guide that's available that we keep updated. And so as we continue to receive resources and information in from our stakeholders, we provide that information and have a platform to share those um, resources um, to those that are engaging with our website. We also have a very strong social media presence presence and making sure that those messages are available from that perspective, um, and then making sure that we have um, infographics and other materials that can be shared um, with those, like I said, on the, in the grassroots um, uh, level, those that are employers and being able to um, efficiently and effectively communicate with, with um, individuals at, a, at that level as well, where there is not um, access to electronic media sources. 
Um, the last thing is expanding testing. Um, we understand how important testing is. We are constantly working with partners and figuring out new strategies to expand testing opportunities. Um, currently, our efforts have been focused a lot on our faith communities um, across the state. Um, we have been um, coordinating large testing events um, in our metros, um, focused largely right now on, on uh, Nashville, Davidson County as well as Memphis and Shelby County, um, those being the two areas where we're seeing the majority of the cases and um, uh, deaths occur, and so wanted to spend a lot of effort um, focusing on those communities and working with the faith communities to provide the site, the location, um, and, and support us in expanding our testing efforts. Um, we recognize how important the faith communities are um, to communities of color, and um, that being um, so central to um, to the many lives that are um, that are living in, in in our neighborhoods and communities. And so we are partnering with them. We have strong strategy. We have the support of the churches. Um, but we're also wanting to ensure that the resources are available beyond um, the push, the large push of federal resources that we, we have available to the communities. So what we're doing also is working with our um, uh, FQHC partners, our academic clinical partners, um, our community faith-based clinics to ensure that that testing infrastructure remains beyond the, the immediate large volume push of funding resources there. And so establishing relationships with our clinical partners, our community partners, and our faith community is important to sustain the level of access to testing, but also the level of connectedness needing to ensure that the resources, the communications, and all of those channels, all of that information gets translated from from the state down to, um, to the community, to the individuals who need that information. Great. It's a ton of work, um, you know, across those communities. So you talked uh, kind of right at the beginning about some of the barriers that, that you see. So um, what, what do those barriers look like, I guess, not only for getting to testing, but maybe even just hearing the message about what this virus is and isn't and mm. dispelling myths and making sure that, that people get the right message? What, what seems to be getting in the way sometimes of that? So I think um, lack of technology, I think we tend to, we initially um, just always go to social media, television, and those resources as the immediate way to push messaging out. But recognize that many of our communities, particularly those in some of our rural areas, but then also some of those in some of our lower income communities or some of our um, um, immigrant focused communities don't have necessarily the access to the information. And sometimes we tend to utilize a lot of uh, media outlets in other areas that are not necessarily easily accept acceptable. And, um, and those messages never get translated down um, to some of the higher risk um, areas. And so we have um, had to do a lot of work to make sure that we are identifying the best approaches to getting that out, who the gatekeepers are, working, like I said, with the faith community to ensure that they, um, those messages are shared and received by individuals in the community. Um, other barriers um, specifically, um, as it relates to the messages that we're pushing out, um, for one, one being the physical distance message, there's huge barriers when you're when your um, um, efforts are focused on multi-generational, multi-family um, housing um, with the inability to physical distance, um, particularly in households, you know, and a lot of that varies on, on size, the number of rooms that are available in some of these households. And so what happens is um, we have to come up with creative messages um, to, or creative approaches to assist families who may be living in those circumstances um, a way to um, understand um, how to best do that given their circumstances. Um, we are seeing in some cases and some testing events where entire households are positive because of the lack or inability to physical distance, and so that is a barrier as well. Um, the area, other areas um, where it is um, 
where testing is available in some communities, transportation to and from some of the clinical sites that provide testing on a regular basis is some, sometimes a challenge. We do have some support across some communities where mobile testing is available and can be a little more flexible, but um, access and physically getting to testing sites may be a challenge. So that's why it's important to work um, alongside our churches. In some, many of our communities, we have clusters of churches, small churches that are in certain neighborhoods and we partner with those churches to make it make testing access walkable, and I think that's important to to, to continue to work alongside um, our community partners to make walkability um, to testing and, and, and the access a little easier from that perspective. Um, language barriers is another thing. I mean, I can go on and on. We have a variety of barriers that I can sit here and name, but language has been an issue. Um, understanding that many in the, the Latino community don't all speak Spanish, don't all read Spanish, and there's some indigenous um, um, dialects that we are working to translate a lot of our, communi our communications um, from that perspective into it. And then the last barrier is um, understanding um, bias, racism, racism, and um, a lot of challenges relative to cultural competency um, that we're seeing with, um, particularly with our, our immigrant population, but even amongst our African American population and the um, slowness in terms of trying to seek care because of fears of being mistreated or not necessarily receiving the care they deserve. And so that is a huge barrier and something that the Department of Health um, specifically um, have strategies now to move forward to address health equity and cultural competence and understanding implicit bias. And the, I think those especially are such huge barriers, you know, an immigrant population that here's the government is giving you testing right. and you go to an event where the National Guard is the one that's, that's oh, doing yeah. the testing and, and you know, I, I'm not sure I would show right. up to something like right. that. And, and that's been a barrier. And, uh, you know, and even the, the history of, of medicine and, and healthcare and African American population and going back to Tuskegee and, and exactly. beyond um, is, you know, just that kind of deep-seated uh, angst about, um, right. you know, just being wary about the whole situation. So right. it's, those are really, really hard things to overcome. Right. Well, um, let's get to some of your questions. And uh, Dr. Lamar will help me out with uh, the ones that, that she can answer that are about uh, minority uh, communities especially. Um, so who determines when schools reopen? Is that the governor or the schools? So the individual schools on the individual district level are the ones who decide when and how to reopen. So it's not the Department of Ed, it's not the governor, um, it is those individual districts. And so you can imagine, I think we have 140 something school districts and so they're all trying to figure out what reopening looks like to them. And then in addition to those districts, you have a, a vast array of independent schools now with charter schools and um, other types of schools that are out there that, are, that don't necessarily fall under the, the public school um, realm. So there's a whole lot of scrambling going on right now in all of those districts to try to figure out what reopening looks like to them and um, what it looks like in uh, Memphis and, and Nashville may look very different than what it looks like in Pickett County um, where, you know, I think they've had one identified case of COVID-19 in that county so far compared to thousands of cases um, in the metros. So, uh, but that's, that's how all of that is determined. Um, should people on immunosuppressive medication stop taking their meds if there's concern for infection. So generally the, the recommendation is no. Um, certainly if uh, someone were to become seriously ill, then that might be a decision that's made uh, for them if they were hospitalized to uh, stop an immunosuppressant medication, but um, there's no recommendation to stop those medications in people who are just concerned about contracting the virus or even those who have a confirmed but maybe a low symptom case. Um, but anyone who's on immunosuppressive medications is, is followed by their, their physician closely or should be, and um, that would be the first place to, uh, to clarify that. But um, we would not recommend that those medications be stopped. Um, 
what steps are being taken with migrant farmer groups to stop spread? Aren't they living in close quarters? So, um, so we are moving into migrant farmer season here and the, the berry farms and the cucumber farms that will come up, tomato farms, and they generally live in fairly abhorrent conditions. Um, if you can envision sort of a, a railway boxcar with um, lots of beds put into it. So um, if you get one person with coronavirus in a situation like that, you're going to end up with pretty much everyone um, with coronavirus. And that's what we've seen when, um, when cases have popped up in uh, migrant farmer groups uh, is that when they go in and test, there's, there's widespread uh, infection through those communities. So, um, the, the living quarters are certainly a problem and um, one that needs to be addressed on a, a lot of different levels, just um, from basic human um, needs to, to those with infectious disease spread. Uh, some steps that have been taken are to, to try to go in and proactively test in, in those farms, um, to try to separate people who are currently um, infected from, from those who have not been. And uh, those, those migrant farmer groups go from state to state. So a lot of times the migrant farmer groups we get are coming from Georgia. So um, if they can be tested in Georgia and then kept somewhat isolated in Georgia, then they're less likely to be um, harboring the, the virus when they come here. Um, they do typically go into their local towns for uh, religious services on the weekends and to shop. And so in some of those migrant farmer groups where there's been widespread um, virus transmission, they've had to um, stop them from, from going into the towns just to make sure that, that disease isn't being transmitted that way. Um, are we sure that food will not be contam contaminated if coming from a farm with an outbreak? So um, th that's a really good question. So generally uh, on hard surfaces, it's not expected that the virus lives much more than 24 hours. There's sometimes detectable virus up to 72 hours on surfaces, but um, really not in the numbers that it would take to successfully infect someone. Um, this virus is also um, pretty easily killed with heat. So if those foods are going to be cooked, you really don't have to worry about having contamination from those foods. Um, and uh, for those that are not cooked, if they're uh, left for you know, three days from the time that they come um, from the farm or even 24 hours and then they're washed well, there really shouldn't be much concern about um, contracting anything from food. Um, So with the change in rules regarding giving names of tested people to police and fire, et cetera, are there plans to retest in poor areas and get better outcome of people? Okay, so I get it. Um, so the, the, you may have heard that for a while, uh, for March, April, and most of May, um, the positive lists were being provided at the request of um, law enforcement and first responders. Um, and that has now ceased to happen. Um, and so the thought was that that might give some people pause before they would be willing to be tested because they wouldn't necessarily want their names to be given to law enforcement as, as being positive. So um, we continue to just have widespread testing in general. So all of our, um, all of our health departments uh, test every day uh, in those communities, plus there continues to be um, pop-up testing events in all of the major metropolitan areas. Um, a lot of those are headed up by their um, metropolitan health departments, but then also in coordination with the state and the National Guard in some cases. So um, in those more populous urban areas where um, we're releasing those names might have been a concern. Um, there's still ongoing um, availability of testing in those communities. Um, is there concern about an increase in cases due to the protests? Yes. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> so, anytime we have mass gatherings uh, and people who are not six feet apart from each other and wearing masks in a privately 
appropriately social distancing and keeping their hands clean were concerned about transition. Uh, I will say yesterday the, the very large protest that happened in downtown Nashville went right past our building. And the vast majority of those people were masked, which I was very encouraged to see. Um, they were uh, keeping some bit of distance, although I will say like in the, the more kind of, there were areas of the crowd that were much more compact. But um, yeah, so mark the date for, you know, seven to 14 days from now to see um, what kind of effect that might have, have had on this. And we're piggybacking off of that from our office. We have really um, pushed the message that given the large crowding with protest, we, we have to push testing more than ever. And we are planning a huge testing event across Memphis and Shelby County um, on the 19th and 20th um, to ensure that our communities not only are, are out and about um, protesting and, and, and seeking justice, but we need to be healthy and keep our, in our communities healthy in order to realize that justice. And so we're working alongside our local and state leaders, um, representatives from our legislation and um, every county to ensure that that message is, is pushed out to the community. Yeah, that's great. Uh, so the, there's this question, are churches in areas with large migrant populations going back and holding services? And if so, what precautions are being taken to try to stop widespread infection? So, yes. and I would ask, you know, not only migrant areas, but, you know, I think there's widespread variability across um, faith-based communities as to how they're handling going back to services. Right. In many of our migrant populations, unfortunately, a lot of the churches never really stopped having services, which is important because, again, you have a migrant community and they are more likely to engage um, from a trusted entity with faith communities. And so it was it, it, it served a purpose in terms of making sure that their connectivity continues to exist. What I'm seeing amongst African American churches is that that there is a pause um, to to resume face-to-face -face engagement, um, not knowing um, where communities of color are relative to um, positivity and all of that. And so, what we're doing is making sure we're working alongside of our churches um, with with expanded efforts to understand the depth of the positivity in the community but also amongst their congregation prior to them making decisions to open. And so many churches have established task force to, to understand that and work alongside the state um, to understand that prior to dis making those determinations. There's been some, um, some really innovative church uh, services that I've seen. Uh, oh, yeah. Some churches that are using drive-in movie theaters mm -hmm. with the speakers, which is yeah. pretty cool. Um, or, you know, of course, online services, a lot of churches have, yeah. have done that and will continue to do a mixture of in-person and mm -hmm. online services, which also helps to reduce the, the crowding as well. Exactly. Um, someone's asked, what appears to be the impact of COVID-19 on vaccination rates in Tennessee? So um, it's, it's terrible. Uh, in, we have the April numbers and our vaccination rates were down 39% in April 2020 compared to April 2019. Uh, I won't have the main numbers until the middle of this month because um, the, our providers have two weeks to report immunizations that they give into the state registry, so we want to make sure that we give them time to get those numbers reported. Um, but not only here, but in other states uh, where vaccination rates have in some cases dropped by 50, 60, 70 percent, and then as travel begins to open up, we, you know, we're very, very concerned about um, outbreaks of measles and pertussis and chickenpox and um, other types of um, vaccine-preventable diseases where it's really important that we maintain um, high numbers, uh, high levels of herd immunity if we're going to um, continue to avoid those kinds of outbreaks. Um, there's a question here, are the screening questions for employees going to remain as what is recommended currently? For example, diarrhea, sore throat, we are reaching a problem of sending employees home every day to await testing results when it may be minor symptoms that are not related. And um, yeah, it's, I, I would agree with that, that um, I even, I was at my doctor's office this morning actually and they asked me um, this litany of, of things or, you know, basically if, if I had had a 
uh, you know, a sneeze in the last 24 hours. They wasn't going to be allowed in the building. And so, so there is a degree to which this can be taken, um, you know, a little bit out of control. So certainly temperature needs to be screened for. And then the, um, the typical, you know, have you had recent onset of sore throat or cough or shortness of breath? Um, and then there have been some, some individuals who have had diarrhea as their only symptom. Um, if they have acute diarrhea, they probably shouldn't be at work anyway just because we can be passing norovirus and um, other types of, of easily transmitted uh, GI viruses as well. So um, those, those are likely the symptoms that really need to be, um, to be focused on. Um, some have suggested that, that you uh, say, or a combination of fever plus some different things, um, you know, some combination of those symptoms so that it's not just if you've had a rash, you can't come to work, but if you've had a fever and a cough and a rash, uh, and all of those things have happened acutely, then, then maybe uh, you should be sent home that day until you um, get some other um, evaluation. And then uh, I think we've got time for one more, which is I'm going to address this PPE question. So is there a limit to how many times we can request PPE? So there, there is not a limit. Um, what happens when you go on the site is that you're asked to put in your burn rate and then you're asked to put in your request. And so your burn rate should equal your request. And if you have a burn rate with the number of employees you have of 10 gallons a week, then um, a two-week supply would be a request for 20 gallons, and that's what they go by. So you can go in every two weeks, report your burn rate, and then um, make another request for PPE. Um, and that will be ongoing as long as we have supply at TEMA and or while we're waiting for those channels to open up so that you can begin to procure that on your own. Um, and same goes for um, the state providing free tests. Um, for now, as far as testing goes, the state is paying for tests um, across the state. They're reimbursing for testing that's done for people who don't have insurance uh, at a rate of $70 a test. Um, and they'll continue to do that for as long as there are, is funding available to be able to do that. So for the foreseeable future, um, we expect that the state will continue to offer um, free testing to those who need free testing. And insurance companies um, are likely going to continue paying for uh, testing for those who have insurance. So um, that's what time we have today, and we'll address the rest of these questions in the Q&A that we'll post to the website along with the slides for today. Um, I wanted to give one, uh, oh, here, if you want to go on to Menti and tell us what, um, what you want to know in future uh, webinars, we always look at these to try to determine what kind of content we want to provide. Um, a quick uh, self-promotion for a webinar that my program is hosting on June 18th, Repairing the Damage, Restoring Immunization Rates in Tennessee. That will be Thursday, June 18th at noon central, and um, you can register at the link that's here. Um, there's also been a communication sent out pretty widely to those who are involved in the VFC program or in tennis. And then um, next week we will be here again, and if you'll tell us what you want to hear about, we'll make sure that we give you those updates. So we will see you next Friday at noon. In the meantime, stay safe, and be sure to reach out if there's anything that we can be doing for you. And Dr. Kimberly Lamar, thanks so much for being on today. Thank you. Y'all have a great weekend.